Now, as you know, I've been talking a lot about, on and off at least, for the last couple of years, about Holy Grail day hunting. And Holy Grail day is a wide range bar, and it could be in a stock or an ETF, but I've been focusing on ETFs for this particular strategy, and then use other strategies in the core trades to try to catch that holy grail day and obviously open a gap reversals to try to catch that holy grail day but her holy grail day starts at one end ends at the other and i did i don't know if that'll come out on the camera but last week i was talking about some of the research that i did where i program in the holy grail days and go in and watch last week's week of charts especially if you have trouble sleeping and where i talk a lot about the holy grail days and there's certain things that I've been doing to to find those holy grail days. Well, one thing that I found is sometimes it helps when you're working on a project like that instead of looking for the exact thing you're looking for, maybe look for some things that you're not looking for and how do you avoid those things? And where I'm going with all this is I'll print money in ETFs. And this is especially true in like the, the S&P futures, right? And that's why you don't hear me talk tremendously about the S&P futures because it's such a difficult market to trade. And like, I'll do really well in the S&P futures and then I get chewed up, chewed up, chewed up, chewed up, chewed up. And I think some of the discoveries I'm gonna share with you tonight might help you from getting chewed up as much. It's certainly gonna help me from getting chewed up as much in the S and P futures, but anyway, the formula for trading success is obviously figure out when to trade. Okay, I can't find a setup to save my life right now. Sit in your hands. Look at where the S and P's been. Look at where the Russell's been. Look at where the Nasdaq has been today. Notwithstanding, it's been all over the place and chopping sideways. Well, I don't feel so bad about not recommending any core position trades and not taking any core position trades during that time. Now I've taken some intraday ETFs, I've taken some ogres, uh, some of which I wish I wouldn't have, but that's another story. And I've also done obviously some IPO trades, but figure out when to trade, when, when conditions are conducive for your methodology. And probably more important is figure out when not to trade. In fact, that's the real holy grail. Like I said a minute ago, I can do really well in S&P futures, especially, you know, give me a nice fat wide range bar day and I'll just ride the mess out of them and take partial profits and I'll just sit on them all day long. And it's just, it's like butter. And the same thing, obviously for ETFs. My problem though, is getting chewed up in between. Maybe part of that's a little bit ego, admittedly, but it's got me really thinking where I need to focus as much on when to trade. I'm sorry. I need to focus as much on when not to trade as I do on when to trade. And also here, my life's going to get a lot easier, especially with this intraday stuff, because I feel like I had a lot more freedom before I did as much intraday trading as I'm doing now. I've always done a little day trading here and there, but now I am just because there's so much going on with business, I'm, I tend to be stuck here. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I'm stuck here. So I'm here anyway. So that's why I'm, I'm working on a lot of these things as, as side projects. And as I've been calling them profit centers, if I can make this profit center to generate, and I hate to use the word income, but to generate, because it's hard to generate income through the market, you can generate capital gains, but you, it's hard to say you want a paycheck from the market. And that, that goes all the way back to the living war days. But if I could generate some sort of profit center to where it's profitable over the short to intermediate term, then that's an additional way to build wealth. Or in my case, as I was talking with one of you guys last week, I'm taking half of those profits and I'm putting them towards fun stuff. So I don't have to borrow money if I want to do something and not go into savings or go into savings or whatever the case may be. I just I just pay for it. And I don't want to make it sound easier than it is because it's it's hard 
to try to produce, to try to make money over a set time frame under that pressure. You have to seem like you don't need the money, as one of my clients often says. Anyway, just real quick, this is the service portfolio coming in today. You'll notice I have no setups, excuse me, recommended. And that goes all the way back to the middle of July. And I hope we have something to do soon. And I think we're getting there, but I'm not gonna force the issue. I'm gonna let the market come to me. The only thing that scares me a little bit, and last time we went through this phase this bad, I think it was last summer, no, summer before last, it was this bad. The one day out of the blue, we had two setups and it was right after somebody emailed me and said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna take a break for a little while. <laughs> And those turned out to be two of the biggest winners of the year. I don't know, I've said that a thousand times. But one of the problems with trading momentum is the outlier effect. You miss a couple of outliers, your year's not as good as it could have been. And we just had like, I wish CPE was still in here so I could show you, but CPE was up 600% at one point. And believe me, this number down here looked a hell of a lot better. But if you miss those few outliers or, and those outliers come like after a period of inactivity, then you gotta be really careful. And the the other thing that's a bit of a paradox is your best trading tends to come after, well, your best trading tends to come after your worst trading and your worst trading, unfortunately, tends to come after your best trading. But along the lines of setups, your best setups tend to come after when you don't have any setups for a while because everything's sort of, as Livermore said, all the people that are in and out, in and out, they're laying the foundation for your next venture. Now, I hate to say that too much because it puts a lot of pressure on me and a lot of expectations from you that, hey, the next setup he recommends might be the one. Give me, give me four or five. Give me the next, within the four or five next setups. Obviously, I can't guarantee it, but I'd, I'd be willing to bet. And boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang myself here. But I'd be willing to bet out of the next five setups, we have one big winner that makes it all worthwhile. And we'll see. We'll see. And, and, and now I'm a little nervous, but I think I, I, I'm feeling it. I think we can make it happen. All right. So getting back to the intraday stuff with the leverage ETFs. And again, this is kind of a, an ancillary thing I'm doing now. It's kind of S&Gs. But if I can make this work longer term, I could turn it into a profit center. Profit center, I borrowed that term from Linda Rasky, and she talked about people would come, come and go uh, in her office, and they would be into different things. And Linda would say, well, let's model it out and see if we could turn it into a profit center, kind of like what David does in here, as opposed to just kind of going by feel, which is probably I'm a little bit more guilty of. But anyway, but one guy seemed to be kind of willy-nilly in what he was doing, and she's like, "Well, look, let's 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 noodle with this a little bit, and if we can make it work, we'll throw a little money at it, and we'll make it a profit center." So that's kind of my goal with all this. So a couple of weeks ago, I said that on July 22nd, I didn't have any trades in these ETFs, and they all made inside day. So this is something I've been watching for quite a while is maybe consider no action as long as it is currently an inside day. Now, the caveat to that would be, and I don't know if the camera's still on, but if you got a wide range bar, then an inside day, then the range could be big enough on that inside day for trading. But as a general rule, not a hard and fast rule, but as a general rule, if something is chopping within the prior day's range, just sit in your hands a little bit and see where it goes. Or at the least, and I'm kind of thinking out loud here, at the least, as long as it's in a narrow range, wait for two or three fake outs, okay, for that market to truly find its way. And if you miss the, the first one or two or three fake outs, there's no guarantee that you're gonna make money on a trade, but at least you didn't go in two or three times and lose through two or three times in a row trying to catch that trend. So I'm beginning to think more and more that less is more 
because if you catch a day like this here, which if memory serves, I think I did okay on. Let me check real quick. Uh, that's the 14th. And you could avoid those choppy days in between. I don't know if this notebook goes back that far. You'll do pretty darn good. It's a lab U, so it'd have been in what lab D. Please work, please work, please work. No, I didn't make a lot of money on a day. I don't know. No, 15, oh, 14, 14. Here it is. Lab D. Yeah, yeah. I had one of my I had I had a big day, or decent day at least. In, in that one account, and I have a loss of 216, but then I see overall I made 718 on that day, so it was a good day, just in this one one ETF, you know. Now, did I keep all that? I don't know because I know I might have gotten sucked in on one of these other days. So, make good money, make a thousand dollars or whatever, and then figure out how long you sit on your hands until you can make another thousand dollars. 